taken from an old family letter. I am writing to my family to explain why I am no longer my cousin's friend, and to end the misunderstanding my silence has caused. My disagreement with my cousin, John Herncastle, began in India in 1791, during the capture of the town of Seringa Patam under General Baird. Before the battle, the camp was alive with talk of gold and jewels in the palace of Seringa Patam, and particularly of a huge yellow diamond. Ancient Indian writings describe the diamond known as the Moonstone, whose place was originally in the forehead of the Hindu god of the moon. In the 11th century, a golden temple was built for the moon god in the holy city of Benares. The god Vishnu appeared in a dream to the three priests who guarded the diamond. He ordered that it should continue to be guarded by three priests, night and day, until the end of time. Vishnu foresaw disaster for anyone who might take the holy stone, disaster for his family and for all those who received it after him. For centuries, three priests kept watch over the moonstone, until in the early 18th century, the temple was destroyed by a Muslim army. Their leader, Arung Zibi, broke up the moon god and took the jewel. Powerless to get back their holy treasure by force, the priests followed the Muslim army, watching and waiting. Many years went by. Arung Zibi died a terrible death, and the moonstone passed, carrying disaster with it, from one unlucky hand to another, always accompanied by three priests waiting for their chance. In 1794, the Sultan of Seringapatam fitted the jewel into the handle of one of his ceremonial knives. Unknown to him, three Hindus, disguised as servants, were keeping watch in his palace. The night before the attack, I and other officers laughed at my cousin when he became angry with us for not taking the story seriously. We entered the palace at dusk the next day. The day's fighting had whipped my cousin into an excitement close to madness. I was sent to stop soldiers stealing gold and jewels. While I was trying to control the men, I heard terrible screams. Rushing through a door, I saw two Indians lying dead and a third badly wounded, falling beside Herncastle, who held a long knife, dripping with blood. A large precious stone in the handle flashed as he turned to me. The Moonstone will have its revenge on you and your family, cried the Indian before dying. Herncastle turned to me, laughing like a madman, staring at the jewel. Soldiers came in. Clear the room, he shouted. I did so and left immediately horrified by what I had seen. Part One The Loss of the Diamond The events told by Gabriel Betteridge, head servant of Lady Julia Verinder. Chapter One This morning, May the 21st, 1850, my lady's nephew, Mr. Franklin Blake, said to me, Betteridge, I've seen Mr. Bruff, our lawyer, and we talked about the loss of the diamond two years ago. He thinks a complete record of the facts ought to be put down in writing. And I agree with him. The story should be told. And I believe we've found a way to do it. Everyone will tell their part of the story in turn, beginning at the beginning. I have a letter telling how my uncle got hold of the diamond in India. Next, we must tell how the stone reached my aunt's house in Yorkshire two years ago. And then, of course, how it was lost twelve hours after it was given to Rachel. Nobody knows more than you, dear Betteridge, about what went on in the house during that time. So your narrative 
must be the first. I have a clear memory for a man of over seventy. However, I did what you probably would have done. I modestly declare that I was incapable of such a task. But young Mr. Franklin insisted, and here I am at my desk, two hours later, realizing I may have bitten off more than I could chew. Oh well, here goes. I worked for Lord Herncastle, and after he died, when Miss Julia, his youngest daughter, married Sir John Berinder, I came with her to Sir John's house, here in Yorkshire. I married a local girl, but five years later she died, poor soul, leaving me with my little girl, Penelope. Soon afterwards, Sir John died, and my lady was left with her only child, Miss Rachel. My lady made sure that Penelope was educated, and when she was old enough, she became Miss Rachel's maid. My lady promoted me. I became manager of her farms in Yorkshire, and carried on this work until, on Christmas Day, eighteen forty-seven, my lady invited me to tea. Gabriel, she said, "It is time to work less. From today, you will give up the outdoor work." And simply look after the servants here in the house. I protested, but looking out over the cold grey hills, I knew she was right. Chapter two. I shall begin with the morning of the twenty-fourth of May, eighteen forty-eight. My lady called me into her sitting room. My nephew Franklin Blake has returned from abroad. She said, "He is coming to stay until Rachel's birthday next month. He will arrive tomorrow." I calculated he was twenty-five years old. I hadn't seen him since he was a boy, the nicest little boy I've ever known. The fun he and Rachel had playing together. He'd gone abroad to schools in Germany, Italy, and France. And had then wandered around Europe, no doubt, borrowing everywhere he went. I remembered he still owed me a halfpenny. He spent like water, probably on those continental women he mentioned to me in a letter once. His yearly allowance of seven hundred pounds disappeared in an instant. Next morning, my lady and Miss Rachel, expecting Mr. Franklin at dinner time. Drove out to lunch with friends. I inspected our guest's bedroom, left a bottle of wine to warm in the soft summer air, and was about to sit down outside in my favourite chair, when I heard a sound, like a drum. I went round to the front of the house. Three dark-skinned Indian men in white coats, each with a drum, were looking at the house. Behind them stood a small English boy. One of them, a man of most elegant manners, told me in excellent English that they were travelling magicians. He asked permission to perform tricks to my lady. I said she was out, and ordered them to leave. The man bowed beautifully, and they left. I returned to my chair. Until Penelope woke me, excited, saying, "The Indians were planning to do some kind of harm to Mister Franklin." She was in the garden when they left. On the road, thinking they were unseen, one of them had poured ink into the boy's hand, and made signs over his head. "Can you see the Englishman from abroad?" The Indian asked him. "I see him." Said the boy, staring at the ink. Has he got it with him? Asked the man. Yes, answered the boy. Will he come here tonight? As he said. Asked another. I can't see any more, said the boy. My mind is full of fog. They made more signs over the boy, woke him up. 
and walked off towards town. Penelope was sick with worry. Father, what does it mean? We'll ask Mr. Franklin when he comes, I replied. Chapter 3 I was nearly asleep again when Nancy, the kitchen maid, rushed out, bumping into my chair. I'm sorry, sir, she said, but Rosanna's late for dinner again. She fainted again this morning and asked to go out for some air. She'll be at the shivering sand, no doubt. I had a kind of pity for Rosanna, so I decided to fetch her myself. Four months before, in London, my lady had visited a home for women who had just been released from prison. She met Rosanna Spearman, who had been a thief, an extremely plain-looking girl with a deformed shoulder. The director recommended her, saying she deserved a second chance. A week later, she began as our second housemaid. Only my lady, Miss Rachel, and I knew about her past, and Rosanna was grateful for our trust in her. She was hard-working and polite, but the servants didn't like her silent, lonely ways. They thought she thought she was superior to them. Our house is near the sea, with beautiful walks in all directions. But a quarter of a mile away is an ugly, lonely little bay that has the most horrible quicksands. When the tide turns, something happens down under the surface. The whole face of the quicksand begins to tremble. No boat ever comes into that bay. Even the birds seem to avoid it. Yet it was Rosanna's favourite place. When I arrived, I saw her sitting in the grey coat she wore to hide her shoulder, looking out to sea. She was crying. I gave her my handkerchief, sat down beside her, and asked her what was wrong. It's my past, sir, she said, drying her eyes. You must forget all that, I said. She took my hand and squeezed it. Why do you like this miserable place? I asked. A strange kind of magic seems to pull me here, she replied. Sometimes I think my grave is waiting for me here. She put her hand on my shoulder. Dear Mr. Betteridge, I'm trying to deserve your trust, but sometimes I feel there's no future for me here. She pointed at the quicksand. Look, she said. The tide was turning. The whole face of the sands was beginning to tremble. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it terrible? She cried. Throw a stone in, sir. Watch the sand. Suck it down. I heard a voice shout, Betteridge! Rosanna jumped up and looked towards the woods behind us. I was astonished by the sudden change in her. Her cheeks turned a beautiful red. Her whole being seemed to brighten with a kind of breathless surprise. I looked round and saw a handsome, beautifully dressed young gentleman coming out of the trees. His smile would have made even the quicksand smile. He sat down beside me, put his arm around me, and said, Dear old Betteridge, I owe you a halfpenny. He looked up at Rosanna. Their eyes met, and her cheeks went an even deeper red. Seemingly confused, she turned and left us suddenly. It was very unlike her. She's an odd one, said Mr. Franklin. Why on earth did she do that? I couldn't, then, offer any explanation for her behaviour. Welcome back, Mr. Franklin, 
I said. He had changed, but he still had the same bright, straightforward look in his eyes. I've a reason for coming earlier than expected, he said. I've been followed by a dark-skinned man in London for the last few days. I took an early train to lose him. Tell me about those Indians who came today. How on earth do you know about them? I asked. I saw Penelope. My father will tell you all about the magicians, she said. She's pretty better edge, and she says your edge is better than ever. His gay mood died away when I told him. Looking worried, he took a small packet from his pocket. It means this, he said. My wicked uncle's famous diamond. He left it to Rachel in his will. My father, who is managing his brother's affairs, gave it to me to bring here. The will states that it must be given to her on her birthday. Your father is managing his affairs, I said. He hated him. So did my lady. She forbade him to ever enter her house again. Let me explain. It became public knowledge that Colonel Herncastle had got possession of the Moonstone in dishonest circumstances. When he returned from India, he was avoided by everyone. For years he led a lonely life, never showing the diamond to anyone. It was said that he was afraid it would cost him his life. Almost two years ago, he came to my lady's house in London, on the night of Miss Rachel's birthday. I was told a gentleman wanted to see me. I left the party upstairs and met him in the hall. He was old, wasted, but looked as wild and wicked as ever. Tell my sister, he said, that I have come to wish my niece a happy birthday. I went upstairs with the message. Controlling her anger, my lady said coldly, Tell Colonel Herncastle that Rachel is busy and that I do not wish to see him. When I told the colonel downstairs, his grey eyes settled on me and he laughed softly. Thank you, Betteredge, he said. Never mind, I shall remember my niece's birthday in the future. He left without another word, and the next I heard of him was that he had died six months ago. Mr. Franklin tapped the packet. I have made some interesting discoveries at Mr. Bruff's office, he said. An old family letter says that it was the object of an ancient holy curse, and also the object of a promise by three Hindu priests. If the colonel knew this, and he almost certainly did, was he deliberately trying to pass on the curse to the sister he hated by giving it to her innocent daughter? I couldn't understand my own alarm. Who, in this age of progress, could believe that the peace of our English country house could be suddenly ruined by an Indian diamond with a Hindu curse on it. Mr. Franklin read my thoughts. I noticed the man following me after I took the stone out of the bank. He looked around him suspiciously. You must understand that the idea of chosen servants of an old Hindu superstition waiting for years for the opportunity to get back their holy stone is perfectly normal, in the oriental way of thinking, that is. Their religion has given them a different idea of patience to ours. The colonel knew this and made clever arrangements to hide the stone during his lifetime. He lay down. I don't want to alarm my aunt unnecessarily, he said, staring up at the sky. 
yet I feel she must be warned. If you were in my place, Betteridge, what would you do? Sir, I said, today is May the 25th. The Colonel's will states that Miss Rachel must be given the diamond on her birthday, June the 21st. We have over three weeks to wait and see what happens. Time will tell us what to do. Until then, put the stone in the bank in Fritzing Hall, our nearest town. Do it now, before the ladies return. He jumped up and pulled me to my feet. Better edge, he said. You're worth your weight in gold. We returned to the house and he left for Fritzing Hall. I wondered whether I wasn't dreaming. The morning's events had put me in such a spin. Chapter 4 When my lady and Miss Rachel returned in the afternoon, I told them that Mr Franklin had arrived, but had had to go into Fritzing Hall on business. Shortly afterwards, Penelope told me she thought Rosanna had fallen hopelessly in love with Mr Franklin. She was behaving strangely. Happy one minute, sad the next. And she kept asking questions about him. She had written his name in her sewing box and taken a lot of trouble with her hair, crying as she looked at her deformed shoulder in the mirror. I almost laughed. A poor, plain housemaid falling in love with a gentleman. Mr Franklin returned shortly before dinner. I was relieved to hear that he hadn't met the Indians and that the moonstone was in the bank. Penelope said Miss Rachel took an unusual amount of trouble with her hair before dinner. A head servant never serves dinner, unfortunately, as I was curious to know how they got on together after all these years. Later we heard them singing happily together with my lady at the piano. Later still I took whiskey to Mr Franklin in the smoking room. She's the most charming girl I've seen since I came back to England, he said. Towards midnight when Samuel, my second in command, and I had locked up the house, I went out to get some air. The moon was full and the air was still. I could hear the sea rolling in over the shivering sand. Then I heard a sound, much closer, and saw a shadow disappear round the corner of the house. I heard feet running away. But by the time I reached the corner, whoever it was had disappeared. Samuel and I took guns, searched the garden, but found nothing. Returning, I saw something shining on the ground. It was a small bottle of black ink. Chapter 5 the next day I showed the bottle to Mr. Franklin. They believe the boy can see where eyes cannot see, he said.
Cuff seemed to approve of Penelope. She told him she saw them finish the last part and had seen it as late as midnight without a smear. She had been careful not to touch it. He examined her dress. There was no trace of paint. He then asked me whether a dog might have entered the room. I said this was impossible. He studied the smear closely and was satisfied it had been made by clothing between midnight and three o'clock on Thursday morning. Yes, superintendent, he said. Please feel free to return to Fritzing Hall. But leave one of your men here, will you? In case I need him. Good morning. He went to the window and stood there, whistling the last rose of summer. Seagrave, deeply offended, marched noisily out. Nodding thoughtfully, his eyes on Miss Rachel's bedroom door, Cuff asked to speak to my lady. Leaving the room, I heard Mr. Franklin say to him, Can you guess yet who has stolen the diamond? Nobody has stolen the diamond, Cuff replied. Chapter 10 Must I see him? My lady said. I don't know why, but I have a feeling that horrible little man is bringing trouble and misery into this house. But if I must see him, I must. Stay with me while we talk, will you, Gabriel? Mr. Franklin returned to Mr. Godfrey, who was soon to be leaving. I took Cuff to my lady's room. At present, only one thing is certain, he said to her. The diamond is missing. He explained the smear on the door. The stained dress may lead us to the stone, he said in conclusion. So I must search the servants' wardrobes, I'm afraid. She refused, saying she would not let them be insulted a second time. I don't think they'll object, your ladyship, he replied. If I tell them, with your permission, that I'm going to search everybody's wardrobes. She seemed to appreciate the sergeant's clever solution. Very well. I agree to let you search my room. I'm sure Miss Verinder, Mr Blake and Mr Ablewhite won't refuse either. Mr Godfrey came in to say goodbye with Mr Franklin. My lady explained the sergeant's plan. Mr Franklin agreed to let his wardrobe be searched. Mr Godfrey offered the sergeant the keys to his luggage saying it could be searched and sent on to London later. Mr. Godfrey left a message for Miss Rachel, which made it clear to me that he had not taken her no for an answer. My lady, said Cuff, as soon as the young gentleman had left, I must be able to account for the clothes in the house, especially the clothes that have been washed. They will be recorded in the washing book. I believe. Rosanna brought in the washing book, looking very tired and pale, and left. He examined the book, shut it again, and said, The last time I saw the woman who brought this book, she was in prison for theft. I told him the truth about Rosanna. My lady made it very clear how satisfied she was with her. You don't suspect her, I hope, she added, getting up to go and ask Miss Rachel for the keys to her wardrobe. The sergeant bowed. I have said, your ladyship, that I don't suspect anyone of stealing. At least, not at the moment. Cuff whistled the last rose of summer until Samuel came in with a note. Miss Rachel flatly refused to let her wardrobe be searched. Ah, said the sergeant, as though somehow expecting this. It's all wardrobes or none. A pity. His sad eyes fell on me. You don't seem too disappointed, I said. Mr Betteridge, he replied. Let's go and have a look at those roses, shall we? 
Chapter 11 Walls have ears, said Cuff, examining a rose. In my business, we prefer the open air. Like this beauty. He sighed. I've decided to search the servants' thoughts and actions instead of their wardrobes. But before I do, can I ask you whether any of them have acted strangely since the loss of the diamond? Rosanna immediately came to mind, but before I could answer, I saw Cuff's eyes suddenly look towards the bushes. What's the matter? I asked. Oh, just a pain in my back, he replied loudly, as though wanting a third person to hear. We went onto the terrace. Does young Rosanna have a lover? he asked. If she hasn't. She's behaving suspiciously. She was hiding in the bushes just now. The bushy path by the rose garden was Mr Franklin's favourite walk. He would take it on his way back from the station. Many times Penelope had seen Rosanna hanging about there since his arrival. I explained this to the sergeant and told him that the poor girl was in love with Mr Franklin. I'm glad. It explains things, he said. And no doubt he hasn't even noticed the girl. Yes, Sergeant, I said. I'm afraid ugly women have a bad time in this world. He looked me very hard in the face, then took my hand and shook it. Mr Betteridge, he said, I like you. Back in my office, he asked me to call the servants one by one. The cook was the first, then my lady's maid, then Penelope. Rosanna was next. She stayed longer than any of them and came out as pale as death. Samuel followed. Nancy was last. When she had left, I went into Cuff's courtroom and found him whistling the last rose of summer. If Rosanna asks to go out... He said, let the poor thing go, but tell me first. The cook entered. Rosanna had asked to go out for some air because she had a headache. I said yes. As soon as the cook had gone, I showed Cuff the servant's entrance and he disappeared. I had a chat with the cook and my lady's maid. Neither of them believed Rosanna had been ill the previous day. They had knocked on her door several times during the afternoon. No answer, and it was locked. They had seen a light under the door at midnight, heard the sounds of a fire at four in the morning, in June. And, of course, they had told Cuff all this. Later, out in the afternoon, I met Mr Franklin on the bushy path. When he had returned... My lady had told him about Miss Rachel's refusal of the search. I told him everything else that had happened. Rosanna Spearman went to Fritzing Hall secretly, he said. She burnt her paint-stained dress. She must have stolen the diamond. I must tell my aunt immediately. Not just yet, please, sir, said Cuff's sad voice behind us. We turned to him. Why not just yet? said Mr Franklin, annoyed. Because, sir, if you tell her ladyship, she will tell Miss Verinder. Mr Franklin walked up to the sergeant and stared threateningly down at him. Are you forbidding me? he inquired. I'm saying, sir, that if you tell Lady Verinder or anyone else before I give you permission, I will abandon the case. Realising he had no choice, Mr Franklin turned away angrily and left us. Mr Betteridge, Cuff said, please leave the detective work to me, will you? He took my arm. What do you want of me now? I said. Information, as usual, he replied with a weak smile. He pointed towards the shivering sand... Show me the beach. 
As we approached the bay in the grey of evening, Cuff said, I understand your charitable feelings for that poor girl, but she's not in the slightest danger of getting into trouble. Not if I can prove she was simply concerned with the disappearance of the diamond. I have evidence as plain as the nose on your face that she's simply an instrument in the hands of another person. Can't you give that person a name? I said. Can't you, Mr. Betteridge? I shook my head. He gave me one of his sad looks. She went secretly to Fritzing Hall yesterday to buy a cloth to make a dress exactly the same as the stained one. The fire in her room was to heat the iron to press the new dress, not to burn the stained one. She knows that the cook and Lady Verinder's maid suspect her, so she still has to hide the dress, doesn't she? I nodded. I followed her this evening to the fishing village, to a cottage. She came out with something hidden under her coat. I followed her north along the coast as far as I could... Unfortunately, there's nowhere to hide along there. I hope we'll meet her by coming round this way. If not, the sand may tell us what she's been doing. I felt suddenly uneasy. I could hear Rosanna telling me that the quicksand seemed to be pulling her to it against her will. The light was rapidly fading, and, as there often is when the tide is about to turn... An awful, breathless calm hung over the bay. Cold fear ran up my spine as we saw the mirror-like surface of the sand begin to tremble. A most murderous place, said the sergeant, echoing my thoughts, and no sign of her anywhere. We went down onto the beach. The only way to get here from the fishing village is by coming round below the cliffs at low tide, I said. We had walked south a hundred yards when Cuff suddenly kneeled. A woman's, he said, examining footprints in the sand. They went round in circles, then finally into the water. She was obviously trying to hide where her walk ended, to hide whatever she had under her coat. Perhaps if we go to the cottage, we may find out what it was. We reached the fishing village before dark. The cottage belonged to a family called Yolland. The daughter, Lucy, who had a deformed foot, had made friends with Rosanna. Mrs Yolland invited us in. The fisherman and his son were out. Lucy, always tired and weak, was upstairs. Cuff showed wonderful patience, casually bringing the talk round to Rosanna. He assured her that his only aim was to clear Rosanna of unfair accusations by the other servants concerning the Moonstone. They hated the poor girl, Mrs Yolland interrupted. She said she was going to leave very soon. I see, said Cuff sadly. So she has no other friends, apart from you. Oh, yes, replied Mrs Yolland. This evening she went upstairs on her own. I want to write to a friend, she said. And later she bought some things she needed for travelling. She showed us a metal case. We had two of these. I sold her one. Sailors used them for keeping things dry. And I sold her two chains. Softly, Cuff began whistling The Last Rose of Summer. Chapter 12 Yes, said Cuff, as we left the village in the dark. She joined the chains to the case and sunk it in the water or in the quicksand, fixing it to the rocks. All very clear, but the mystery is, what is in the case? Not the diamond, obviously. Not the diamond, I thought. The stained dress, then. He stopped and turned to me in the shadows. 
Does anything that is thrown into that quicksand ever come out again? Never, I answered. The question is why, Cuff continued. Why not just tie the dress around a heavy stone and throw it into the quicksand? But is it a dress? Could it be a nightgown, for example? I must go to Fritzing Hall tomorrow and find out what she bought. When we got back, the servants were at supper. Rosanna had returned an hour before, had gone upstairs to take off her coat, and was now sitting quietly with them. I followed Cuff round to the back of the house. He looked up at Miss Rachel's bedroom window, watching lights passing to and fro. I bet you a pound, Mr. Betteridge, he said, that an hour ago, Miss Verinder decided to leave the house. Samuel met us inside. Her ladyship is waiting to see you and Sergeant Cuff, he said. How long has she been waiting? asked Cuff. An hour, sir, Samuel replied. As I knocked on my lady's door, Cuff whispered, I shouldn't be surprised if there's a disturbance in the house tonight. Only a small lamp was on in the room. Sergeant, said my lady from the shadows. Miss Verinder decided about an hour ago to go and stay with her aunt, Mrs. Abelwhite, in Fritzing Hall. She will be leaving tomorrow morning. Might it be possible, my lady, to persuade her to delay leaving a little? I have to go to Fritzing Hall tomorrow morning and won't be back until 2pm. I would like to say a few words to her unexpectedly before she goes. Unwillingly, my lady accepted. She told me to tell the carriage not to come until two. And please don't mention me as the cause for putting off her departure, Cuff added. My lady was about to say something, but stopped herself. She waved her hand for us to leave her. She almost told us, Cuff said once we were outside, and the mystery that puzzles you would have been at an end tonight. Curse you, I cried. There's something you've known all this time. Tell me the truth, Sergeant. What do you suspect? I don't suspect. I know, he said calmly. Are you trying to tell me she stole her own diamond? I said. She has had it all the time, calculating that we will suspect Rosanna. He almost smiled. We'll let the matter rest tonight, I think. I'm hungry. Would you like to have supper with me? I said I'd lost my appetite, left him with the gardener, and went out for some air. Dark clouds were gathering in the distance. The wind was rising. Bad weather was on the way. Samuel brought me a note from my lady. The judge in Fritzing Hall had written to remind her that the three Indians were to be released early in the coming week. If we had any more questions to ask them, there was no time to lose. When I got back inside, Cuff and the gardener were arguing about roses over a bottle of whiskey. He read the message, searched his mind a moment, said, I believe there is a gentleman in Fritzing Hall who is an expert on Indian matters, and then returned to the argument. I met Penelope in the passage outside. She had been helping Miss Rachel pack. Apparently, when her mother had told her that her departure had to be delayed, she had been violently angry. Her mother, equally angry with Miss Rachel, went to her, whispered something in her ear, and Rachel left the room. Miss Rachel's bell rang while we were talking, and Penelope left me. Later, as I was putting the lights out, I couldn't help feeling that some terrible threat was hanging over us all. Upstairs, in front of Miss Rachel's rooms, I found Cuff, lying asleep on three chairs put together across the corridor. What are you doing here? I asked. Whatever Rosanna may have hidden, it was clear to me that Miss Rachel couldn't go away until she knew it was hidden. The two of them must have communicated tonight if they try again, I want to be in the way. Chapter 13 
Next morning, Cuff didn't leave for Fritzing Hall straight away, as expected. I met Mr Franklin on his favourite walk down the bushy path. The sergeant joined us. What do you want? Mr Franklin said to him sharply. I want to remind you, sir, Cuff replied, that I am an officer of the law, and it is your duty to give me any special information which you possess. I have no special information, and have nothing to say. Not even about Rosanna Spearman, said Cuff. Hasn't she spoken to you, or tried to speak to you? As Cuff said this, Rosanna appeared nearby. Penelope was with her, obviously trying to make her go back inside. Seeing Mr Franklin, Rosanna stopped. Cuff, pretending not to notice them, said loudly, You needn't be afraid of harming the girl, sir. I take no interest in Rosanna Spearman, Mr Franklin replied. Hearing this, Rosanna turned away. She let my daughter take her by the hand and lead her inside. I shall go to Fritzing Hall now, Mr Betteridge, Cuff said quietly. Expect me back at two. After breakfast, after Mr Franklin had left for a long walk in the rain, Penelope came to me. Please talk to Rosanna, father, she said. I'm so worried about her. Mr. Franklin has hurt her cruelly without intending it. I asked her why she was in the garden. She wanted to speak to him, she replied. I tried to stop her. I told her she was stupid to expect him to take any interest in her. She frightened me, father. She turned to stone when he said those words. Since then she's gone around in a kind of dream. We found her sweeping a corridor. There was a strange dullness in her eyes. Cheer up, Rosanna, I said. If you've got something on your mind, you can tell me. I'm your friend. She went on sweeping, more like a machine than a living person. Yes, but I shan't trouble him today. You can tell me. If it will relieve your mind, said Penelope. No, she said to herself. I know a better way of relieving my mind. We left her as we had found her, like a woman in a dream. She should see a doctor, I thought, then remembered that Dr Candy was extremely ill. There was his strange assistant, Ezra Jennings, but I, and no one else, trusted him. Cuff returned at ten to two. I saw the Indians with Mr Murthwaite, he said. They will be set free on Wednesday. There is no doubt that they came here to steal the Moonstone, but I am equally sure they have nothing to do with the loss of the jewel. One thing is certain, Mr Betteridge, if we don't find it, they will. Mr Franklin, returning, passed us in silence. Rosanna bought a length of plain cloth, said Cuff, enough to make a nightgown. Plain cloth means servant's cloth. But why, having made the replacement, does she hide the smeared nightgown instead of destroying it? There is only one way of finding out if she won't tell us. We must search the shivering sand. Samuel arrived with Miss Rachel's carriage at two. When you leave, said Cuff, you'll see a man waiting among the trees by the gates. He'll jump up on the back of the carriage. All right. My lady came out, said nothing to me or Cuff and stood stiffly waiting for her daughter. Rachel came downstairs, colourless, her eyes bright and fierce. She kissed her mother hurriedly, said, 
try to forgive me, Mama, and ran to the carriage. Cuff jumped in front of her. What do you want? she said angrily. Your leaving makes it extremely difficult for me to find the diamond, said Cuff. She got in and ordered the carriage to leave. My lady, in sorrow and shame, turned to go inside, nearly bumping into Mr. Franklin as he ran down the steps. Goodbye, Rachel, he shouted, waving. Drive on, Miss Rachel shouted to Samuel. Mr. Franklin called after my lady as the carriage drove away. Aunt, you were right. Now I must leave. Thank you for all your kindness. Tears in her eyes, my lady went inside. Mr. Franklin turned to me. Please, Betteridge, get me to the station, he said, and went inside. It's time to sort this business out, said Cuff. Where's Rosanna Spearman? We asked servants. She hadn't been seen for an hour. Your dear Rosanna won't slip through my fingers that easily, he said. She and Miss Rachel will meet at Fritzing Hall. She's either gone there, before I can get there, or she's gone to the shivering sand. Nancy, the kitchen maid, said she had seen Rosanna stop the butcher, who had just delivered meat to the house, and ask him to post a letter. The butcher had said it was a complicated way to send a letter to the fishing village, that it wouldn't get there until Monday. Rosanna had said that it didn't matter how long it took to arrive, and the butcher had driven away with it. Well, I asked, when we were alone again. The hiding place is in that letter, Cuff replied. I shall pay Mrs. Yolland another visit on Monday. Chapter 14 Duffy, the gardener's boy, had seen Rosanna half an hour before, running towards the sea. Come with me, Duffy, said Cuff. And you, Mr. Betteridge, stay here till I come back. They hurried off towards the shivering sand. But not long afterwards... Duffy came running back. I had to send one of Rosanna's shoes quickly. I sent him back to say I would follow with the shoe. Fifteen minutes later, I reached the shore. Dark clouds were rushing low overhead. The sea was thundering at the mouth of the bay, sending great waves rolling in over the sand. Cuff was alone on the beach. Hearing me approach behind him, he turned. There was a look of horror in his eyes. He grabbed the shoe out of my hand and placed it in a footmark in the sand. It fitted exactly. We followed the footprints to the mouth of the bay. They went into the water at a place where the rocks and the sand joined. Seconds earlier, the rising tide had wiped them out. We looked everywhere for footsteps coming back towards land until the rising water forced us to stop. Cuff stared out over the waters, rushing in deeper and deeper over the whole face of the quicksand. There was a look of defeat on his face. A fatal accident has happened to her on those rocks, he said. I could no longer feel the driving rain. All I could hear was her telling me that the sands seemed to be pulling her to a watery grave. The horror of it struck me. Gently, Cuff led me away from where she had died. Yolland ran up to us. He looked down at Rosanna's footprints dissolving in the rain. Is there any chance of finding her when the tide turns? asked the sergeant. None, said the fisherman. What the sand gets, the sand keeps forever. On our way back, Duffy ran up to us with a note. Penelope found this in Rosanna's room, 
he said. Tears came to my eyes as I read it. Mr. Betteridge, when you next see the shivering sand, please try and forgive me. Yes, I found my grave there. I died grateful for your kindness. Rosanna Spearman. The notes had thrown the whole house into a state of panic. As we passed my lady's door, she threw it open violently, with a horrified look on her face. Mr. Franklin was trying to calm her. This is your fault, she shouted at Cuff. Gabriel, give this miserable person his money and remove him from my sight. I will accept your dismissal, but not your money, Cuff replied. I am paid for doing my duty, which is not yet done. Oddly... My lady seemed almost embarrassed by his flat, professional manner. He went on, When I have told you plainly, your ladyship, what action must be taken to get back the moonstone, my responsibilities will have ended. After a moment's thought, my lady signalled Cuff and me to follow her back into her room. Your ladyship, said Cuff when we had sat down, I believe some unbearable anxiety concerning the diamond drove Rosanna to suicide. And I believe your daughter can tell us whether this is true. My lady took her checkbook, looked at Cuff steadily and said, You suspect Miss Verinder of deceiving us by hiding the diamond for some purpose of her own? That is it. My lady, I know my daughter, Sergeant, and I can tell you she is absolutely incapable of doing what you suspect. She sighed, controlling herself. Nevertheless, I give you permission to go on and explain yourself. Thank you, said Cuff. But I must be frank, your ladyship. It has been my experience that young ladies of Miss Verinder's social position can have debts which they dare not admit to their nearest relatives and friends. Events and behaviour in this house suggest this to me. Miss Verinder is still extremely upset more than 24 hours after losing her diamond. She has developed a sudden strange dislike for Mr Blake the superintendent, and myself, the three people who have been most actively trying to find her jewel. And, of course, she refuses to cooperate. Her behaviour tells me she has debts and has pawned the diamond to pay them. He continued, unbothered by our shocked silence, that is the case against her. Now, what is the case against her and the dead Rosanna Spearman together? As soon as I saw Rosanna, I suspected her of being involved. It was a cleverly planned conspiracy from Miss Verinder's point of view. Better than leading us to think that the Moonstone was simply lost, she could trick us into believing it was stolen by a woman with a criminal record. Poor dead Rosanna was the ideal person to help her pawn the stone privately. She knew one of the few men in London who could advance a large sum of money on such a famous jewel, without asking questions. I will now tell you what I propose to do. I intend to watch Miss Verinder closely and I shall send one of my men to make an arrangement with that money-lender in London. You can be sure Rosanna gave his name to Miss Verinder. Would you agree to this? No, said my lady flatly. Cuff went on, undiscouraged. Another way, my lady, would be to tell Miss Verinder, without warning, of Rosanna's death. Sudden sorrow may encourage her to admit everything. Would you agree to this? To my astonishment, my lady nodded. 
Then, my lady, said Cuff, getting up, I wish you good morning. My lady raised her hand. Sergeant, I feel it would be better if I told her. I will go to Fritzing Hall. You may rely on me to try the experiment. As soon as my lady had left, I informed Mr. Franklin of her decision. He decided to wait for the news from Fritzing Hall before leaving. I returned to Cuff. He was studying his diary. I was seeing what my next professional appointment is, he said. You think it's all over? I said. I think Lady Verinder is an extremely clever woman. Now, where is that gardener? I promised to teach him something about roses before I left. My lady's carriage returned earlier than expected. She had decided to stay at her sister's in Fritzing Hall for the time being. The driver brought two letters. One for Mr Franklin, one for me. A cheque dropped out of mine when I opened it. The sergeant appeared on the steps. Ah, he said in his sad way. News from her ladyship? I read him the letter. Gabriel, Miss Verinder declared that she has never spoken a private word to Rosanna or communicated with her by other means. They never met, not even accidentally, on the night the diamond was lost. I warned her that her behaviour was inviting suspicion. She assured me that she has no debts to anybody and that the diamond has never been in her possession since she put it in the drawer on Wednesday night. She remained stubbornly silent when I asked her if she could explain the stone's disappearance. Tears in her eyes, she said, The day will come when you will know why I am silent. Give Sergeant Cuff this cheque and tell him that I am absolutely certain that his suspicions are mistaken. Cuff's eyebrows went up when he looked at the cheque. I will always remember her ladyship's generosity, he said. But he placed it on the table. A fine woman. Yes, Lady Verinder has smoothed things over very cleverly for the moment. But we shall hear more of the Moonstone before too long. If you don't think Miss Rachel is telling the truth, then prove it, I said angrily. I was sick of his accusations. He was so obviously wrong. Miss Rachel was incapable of doing what he suspected. He wasn't offended. Quite the opposite. He took my hand and shook it. You're a fine man, sir, he said warmly. I won't say a word more about Lady Verinder and her daughter. I'll simply say that these three things will happen. First, you will hear from the Yollands after Rosanna's letter is delivered on Monday. Second, you will hear of the three Indians again. Here, if Miss Rachel remains here. In London, if she goes to London. And third, sooner or later... You will hear from Mr. Septimus Luca, a money lender. Time will tell if I am right or wrong, Mr. Betteridge, and if we don't meet again before I retire from this dirty job, I hope you'll come and visit me at my cottage near London. And bring the gardener. I'll teach that man a thing or two about roses. I couldn't help liking the man, even though I hated him. Chapter 15. Mr. Franklin had made up his mind to leave. Wait a day or two longer, sir, and give Miss Rachel another chance, I said. He handed me my lady's letter. Franklin, I am forced to believe now that the Moonstone's mysterious disappearance is no mystery to Rachel. I have tried everything but something forbids her from breaking her silence. She is in a pitiful state of nervous excitement. 
I shall take her to London for a change of air and some medical advice. Please come and see us there, will you? But not straight away. It is impossible to reason with her at the moment, and for the moment you two are better apart. Give her time. The Moonstone has given Colonel Herncastle his revenge, said Mr Franklin. But in a way he never dreamt of. We said goodbye, and sad and weary I went inside. He was right. The diamond had brought us nothing but unhappiness. The next day, Sunday, Samuel brought a message. My lady and Miss Rachel were leaving directly from Fritzing Hall for London that day. Penelope was to accompany them, but I was to remain in the country. I had said goodbye to Penelope at the gates and was walking back through the rose garden when I heard my name called. I turned and saw limping Lucy. Where's Franklin Blake? she said fiercely. Mr. Franklin Blake, you mean, I replied. Murderer Franklin Blake, I mean, she shouted. He caused her death. What makes you say such a thing? I replied angrily. You don't care, she said softly. Everybody treated her badly, except me. I loved her. Tears came to her eyes. I'd saved up a little money. We were going to go and live together in London and earn our living by sewing. Until he came. She lost her mind when that man arrived. I can't live without him and... Oh, Lucy never even looks at me. It was pitiful. And then her letter came this morning. Wiping her eyes, she cried. Where is he? He's in London, I replied. Why do you want to see him? I have a letter from Rosanna to give him. If he wants it, he must come back and get it from me. I and nobody else must give it to him. She turned and limped away towards the shivering sand. On Tuesday morning, a letter came from Mr Franklin's father's head servant, an old friend of mine. He mentioned that Mr Franklin had left England for Europe on Sunday morning. And so, for some time to come, there would be no hope of knowing whether Rosanna's letter contained a confession or not. Thursday brought news from Penelope. A London doctor had earned a lot of money by suggesting that the best cure for Miss Rachel was amusement, flower shows, operas, dances, that sort of thing. Mr. Godfrey had visited and was most politely received. Saturday's post brought an envelope from Cuff containing an article from a London newspaper, a report from the law courts. Mr. Septimus Luca, a dealer in Oriental jewellery, complained to the court that he had been annoyed by three poor Indians. Again and again they had tried to enter his house, asking for charity. Mr. Luca believed they intended to rob him and demanded that they should be arrested. The judge dismissed the complaint, saying there was no evidence. He advised Mr. Luca to get the police's advice on how to protect his property. The devilish Indian diamond had left us and found its way to London. And so, it is here that I must leave the story for someone else to take up. Part Two The Discovery of the Truth, 1848 to 1849. First narrative by Miss Clack, niece of the late Sir John Berinder. Chapter One. My dear parents, both now in heaven, taught me to fold my clothes carefully, to always say my prayers before going to bed, and to keep a diary. The last of these excellent habits will, I hope, enable me to be useful to a wealthy relation. 
Recently, Mr. Franklin Blake wrote to me here in France, where I have been forced to live for economic reasons. He asked me, with the typical lack of feeling of the rich, to reopen wounds that time has hardly closed. He offered me a small sum to write a narrative of what I witnessed while visiting Aunt Verinda in London. After much searching of myself, I decided that it was my Christian duty to swallow my pride, accept his cheque, and help him. My diary tells me I was accidentally passing Aunt Verinda's house in Montague Square on July the 3rd, 1848, and felt that it would be polite to knock. The daughter of that godless old devil, Betteridge, answered the door. She informed me that Aunt Verinda and her daughter, I really cannot call her my cousin, had arrived a week before. I sent her upstairs to say that I didn't want to disturb them, but as I was passing, I wondered whether I could be of any use to them. When the Betteridge girl came downstairs, I decided to have a Christian word with her about the unnecessary amount of ribbons on her cap. She opened the front door before telling me, with the minimum of politeness, that I was invited to lunch tomorrow. I left. That evening we had a meeting of the Young Mother's Small Clothes Society. I was a member of the Charities Committee, as was my precious and most admirable friend, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. To my disappointment, he did not appear that night, and I was shocked to hear from my Christian sisters of the committee that the previous Friday, he and a gentleman called Mr. Septimus Luca had been victims of a strange conspiracy. According to the newspapers, early on June the 30th, our gifted Mr. Abelwhite, after cashing a cheque at a bank in Lombard Street, passed Mr. Luca a perfect stranger, who happened to be leaving the bank at the same time. The stranger insisted on Mr. Godfrey leaving first, and the two men went their separate ways. Mr. Godfrey went back to his house in Lambeth, where a poorly dressed young boy was waiting for him. The boy handed him a letter, saying he had been asked to deliver it by an old lady he didn't know. It asked him to go an hour later, to a house in Northumberland Street. The woman, who intended to give a large sum of money to charity, wanted information on the Young Mother's Small Clothes Society. Our Christian hero never hesitates when good can be done. He went instantly. A very respectable-looking Englishman answered the door and led him to an apartment at the back of the house. Entering, Mr. Godfrey noticed an ancient Oriental book on the table. As he was admiring it, a brown-skinned arm took him by the neck. He struggled, but there was more than one person. His eyes were bandaged, he was tied to a chair, and was searched. Words were spoken in a foreign tongue. Then the men left. He was discovered later by the owners of the house. They had rented the apartment to the Englishman the day before. Seeing that the door had been left open for a long time, they went in to see if anything was wrong. Mr. Godfrey's belongings were lying everywhere, but nothing was missing. The Oriental book was gone. Had Mr. Godfrey been the victim of a strange mistake? Later that day, the same thing happened again. Mr. Luca, having left the bank, visited various parts of London on business. Returning home, he found a letter waiting for him. A customer from Manchester, a collector of Oriental antiques, announced that he was on a short visit to London and desired to see Mr. Luca urgently about an important sale. He drove immediately to an address in Tottenham Court Road where exactly the same thing happened to him, with one slight difference. Mr. Luca's gold watch, his wallet, nothing was missing, except one thing. 
a receipt for an extremely valuable object which he had put in the bank. The receipt was useless to anyone else since it clearly stated that only Mr. Luca himself could remove the object from the bank. Mr. Luca hurried to the bank. Nobody had been there with the receipt. He went to the police who told him about Mr. Godfrey's similar experience. They believed that a robbery had been planned and that one of the thieves had seen Mr. Godfrey accidentally speaking to Mr. Luca. On Tuesday, dear Aunt Verinder received me with her usual kindness. However, I soon noticed that something was wrong. Anxious looks kept escaping her in the direction of her daughter, who, as usual, disappointed me. How could such a plain-looking person be the child of such fine parents? After lunch, she got up in her shamefully colourful dress and said, I'll go and read now, Mamma." But tell me if Godfrey calls. I can't wait to hear all about his adventure in Northumberland Street. She gave me a careless look. Goodbye, Clack, she said, and left in a cloud of perfume. I refused to let her make me angry. I did what any good Christian would do. I simply decided to pray for her that night. When we were alone, my aunt told me the whole story of the Indian diamond and of Rachel's worrying behaviour. None of it surprised me. I have known Rachel since she was a child. The one thing that did shock me was Aunt Verinder's decision to have a doctor examine her. The poor girl was more in need of God's help. This strange adventure of Godfrey's has happened at the wrong time, said my aunt. Rachel has been restless and excited ever since she heard about it. Dear aunt, I said, She's obviously keeping a sinful secret from you and everybody. Something in these recent events threatens her with discovery. There was a knock on the door. Miss Cap Ribbons entered and announced a visitor. Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Chapter 2 a model of manners, Mr. Godfrey walked in shortly after the announcement of his name. We both asked him whether he felt himself again after his terrible adventure. My dear aunt, my dear Miss Clack, he exclaimed, what have I done to deserve all this sympathy? I would have preferred to have kept the whole thing to myself. I was overcome by the heavenly gentleness of his smile, by the richness of his deep voice. And how is dear Rachel? he inquired. And you, Miss Clack, I really do hope to be able to be at the young mother's small clothes meeting next week. I was about to reply when we were disturbed by Rachel. I am charmed to see you, Godfrey, she said. I wish you had brought Mr. Luca with you. Never mind. Tell me the whole story immediately. I was sad to see him take her hand. Dearest Rachel, he said, the newspapers have told it better than I can. Rachel, darling, I remarked, true greatness and courage are always modest. Godfrey, she said, not taking any notice of me, I'm sure you are not great, and I'm certain that if you ever had any modesty, your lady admirers took it from you years ago. You have a reason for not talking about your adventure, and I will find it out. My reason is simple, he answered. I am tired of the subject. That won't do. Now sit down. She dragged him to a chair. Have the police done anything, Godfrey? She asked him. No, nothing. People say, don't they, Godfrey, dear, that the three men who trapped you both are the Indians who came to Fritzing Hall? Some people say so, I believe, yes. Do you? My dear Rachel, I never saw their faces. He tried to get up. She pushed him down. You never met Mr. Luca before you met him at the bank? He shook his head. You were questioned together by the police. Did the banker's receipt describe the object left at the bank? He said the receipt wasn't mentioned in his presence. Rachel sighed. 
The newspapers are connecting what happened at Fritzing Hall and what happened here. They say that the object in the bank is... She stopped, her face suddenly white. Dear Mr. Godfrey tried again to leave his chair. Stay where you are, she ordered. They say it's the Moonstone, Godfrey, don't they? To my surprise, a change came over my admirable friend. He lost his smoothness of manner. They do say so, yes. But Mr. Luca has repeatedly declared that he has never seen or heard of the Moonstone. Rachel laughed. She looked at my friend pityingly. Did you know, Godfrey, that certain people are spreading rumours that you pawned the Moonstone to Luca? Suffering this terrible insult, his noble eyes filled with tears. He put out his hand to take hers. She jumped to her feet with a scream. Don't touch me, she cried. She looked at her mother. This is all my fault. I sacrificed myself. I had a right to do that. But not to keep a secret that ruins an innocent man for life. You exaggerate, Mr. Godfrey said. My reputation can't be ruined by rumours like that. All will be forgotten in a week. I must stop it, she cried out. I know who took the moonstone. I know. I know. She stamped on the ground in a peculiar temper. I know that Godfrey is innocent. She fell to her knees at her mother's feet. Oh, Mama, Mama, I must be mad, mustn't I? Mr. Godfrey attempted to calm her. Pulling herself together, she said, Godfrey, I've been so unfair to you. You're a better man than I believed. I'll try and repair the wrong I've done you. She gave him her hand and... He actually kissed it. I will come, dearest, he said, as long as you never mention this hateful subject again. I was deeply shocked by our Christian hero's behaviour. A thunderous knock at the door startled us all. Rachel got up. You've come to take me to the flower show, she said, teary-eyed. She kissed her mother. Mama, before I go, this hasn't caused you too much anxiety, has it? No, no, my dear, go with your friends now and enjoy yourself. She left the room. My heart bled for the poor, misguided girl. Mr. Godfrey gave us one of his beautiful smiles, held out a hand to his aunt, a hand to me. I closed my eyes, put his hand in a moment of self-forgetfulness to my lips and sat down. When I opened my eyes again, he had gone. But alone with Lady Verinda, I was to hear worse. Drusilla, she said, I have something to tell you and a favour to ask you. My lawyer, Mr. Bruff, is coming at five. I want you to witness the signing of my will. I have been seriously ill, Drusilla, for more than two years now with heart disease. And the truth is, I may live another year or die this afternoon. She looked hard at me. Rachel, of course, must not be told. How can I describe the sorrow and sympathy I felt, or the thrilling thankfulness that rushed through me? My dear aunt was totally unprepared to make the great change. Oh, oh, how I can help you, aunt, I said, forgetting myself. She gave me a puzzled, almost frightened look. Aunt, I said, I have some books which you must read, Books that can help you in this hour of need. I had just time to hurry home, get the books and return for the signing of the will. When I returned, the doctor was with Aunt Verinder. I joined Mr. Bruff in the library. He was surprised to see me. We had met on similar occasions more than once. Have you come to stay here, he said, eyeing my large bag full of books. My aunt has asked me to witness her will, I said. I see, he said. Very well. After all, you've no financial interest in it. So tell me, Miss Clack, what's the latest news from the world of ladies' charity? How is your friend, Godfrey Ablewhite? I've been hearing some salty stories about him. Understanding his meaning perfectly, I replied, 
I won't argue with a clever lawyer, Mr. Brath. I will simply say that in the eyes of a famous London police officer, there is not the slightest shadow of suspicion on anyone except Miss Verinder. Do you mean, he replied, that you agree with Cuff? I mean nothing. I am a Christian, Mr. Brough. I judge no one. I judge the sergeant to have been completely wrong, he replied. If he knew Rachel's character as I know it, he would never have suspected her. I admit she has her faults. She's wild, stubborn, secretive. But she's as honest and true as steel. I could not resist telling him the truth. In that case, permit me to inform you that when Mr. Godfrey was here two hours ago, Rachel declared that he was innocent. I went on to describe the whole scene. Everything that was said. You would have made a good lawyer, Miss Crack, he said, when I had finished. He began walking thoughtfully up and down. The new light I had thrown on the subject had obviously disturbed him. What a case, I heard him say to himself. A complete mystery. Excuse me, I said, but may I remind you that Mr. Franklin Blake was also in the house when the diamond had disappeared? His debts are well known. The old devil looked at me steadily with a hard and vicious smile. I manage Mr. Franklin's legal affairs, he said, and I can tell you that most of his lenders, knowing that his father is a very rich and very old man, are quite prepared to be patient. Besides, Lady Verinder has told me that her daughter is ready to marry Franklin Blake. She told her that she loved him. So, Miss Cluck, why would he steal the jewel? The human heart is unsearchable. I said gently. No, no, Miss Clack, he said. Miss Rachel's innocence is without doubt. So is Mr. Ablewhite's. So is Mr. Franklin's. All we know is that the Moonstone came to London and that Mr. Luker or his banker has it at the moment. It puzzles you, me, everybody. A servant came in to say Aunt Verinder was ready to receive us. Chapter 3 my aunt's will was as short as her husband's. Her daughter would inherit everything. A handsome young servant, Samuel, was second witness. The signing took less than two minutes. Afterwards, Mr. Brough looked at me, hoping perhaps that I might leave him alone with my aunt. He might as well have expected the Rock of Gibraltar to move. He said something under his breath and left. My aunt lay down on the sofa. I haven't forgotten you, dear she said. You're not mentioned in the will, but I intend to give you something to remember me by. Here was a golden opportunity. I took a book out of my bag, The Snake at Home, by Miss Bellows. This fine Christian work shows how evil lies in wait for us in the most innocent actions of our daily lives. Read this book, I said, and you will have given me all I could ever want. My poor aunt glanced at the book and handed it back to me, looking more confused than ever. I'm afraid, Drusilla, she said, that the doctor has advised me to read only amusing books. Aunt, I said patiently, let me leave it here. She gave me an exhausted look, so I thought it might be wise to leave. I crossed the hall and slipped into the library, but I noticed two of the amusing books the doctor had recommended. I took out two of mine and put them on top of them. I went into the breakfast room and put two more on the piano. I put a whole pile beside my aunt's sewing box, another by the fireplace. As I folded my clothes that night, I thought of the true riches I was giving to my wealthy aunt in the form of my good Christian books. I felt so light-hearted that I sang a song to Jesus and forgot to pray for Rachel. Next morning, as I was about to leave for Montague Square, my landlady knocked. Samuel was standing beside her with a box, looking as fresh and blue-eyed as ever. I felt a Christian, motherly interest in the boy, so I invited him in. He put the box down, looking as though he wanted to run away, and said there was a letter inside. I delayed him with a few questions, 
Could I see my aunt if I called at Montague Square? No. She had gone out for a drive with Miss Rachel and Mr. Abelwhite. I also discovered that they were going to a concert together the following morning. I offered Samuel tea. He rushed out. We had a meeting of the Young Mothers Small Clothes Society that night. The next day there was a meeting of the British Ladies' Servants Sunday Sweetheart Society. So obviously Mr. Godfrey had no intention of being present at either. I was beginning to see our hero in a slightly different light. Feverishly, I began opening the box. Was it the remembrance my aunt had promised me? No. It was my twelve precious books. I admit I was a little disappointed, but, as you know, the true Christian never gives up. So at two o'clock, there I was with my books again, knocking on Lady Verinder's door. Miss Cap Ribbons said she had had a bad night and was resting on the sofa. I said I would wait in the library. I thought that Rachel and her pleasure-loving friends, Mr. Godfrey included, alas, were all at the concert. So having placed books here and there, I decided to go upstairs and put some in the living room. As I entered, I heard a knock on the door downstairs, then heard Samuel say, Upstairs, if you please, sir. I heard footsteps. Not wanting to be discovered upstairs on my own, I hurried into a small area on one side of the living room and pulled the curtain. The man entered the living room and began walking up and down, talking to himself. Do it today. You must do it today, he kept saying. It was Godfrey Abelwhite. Chapter 4 I was about to rush out and beg him in the name of the ladies' committees to explain himself when I heard Rachel say, Why didn't you go into the library? He laughed softly. Because I was told Miss Clack is in there. She laughed. Clack? In the library? She replied. You're right, Godfrey. We're much better here. Bring that chair nearer to me. Carefully, I moved the curtain so I could see. Well, she went on, what did you say to them? Just what you said to say, dear. They were sad not to see you at the concert. He brought his chair even closer and took her hand. Can words describe how saddened I was by this sight? Have you forgotten, Godfrey? She said. We agreed to be cousins and nothing more. My heart breaks that agreement, Rachel, every time I see you. Then don't see me. No. Am I mad, Rachel, to dream that one day your heart may soften to me? He put his handkerchief to his eyes. Even she seemed to be moved. Are you really sure, Godfrey, that you are that fond of me? You're my only interest in life. Would you believe that now my charitable duties seem like a nuisance to me? When I see a lady's committed now, I wish I was at the other end of the earth. You have made your confession, she said. Now I think the best thing you can do is leave. I'm not good enough for you, Godfrey. I hate myself, don't you understand? She burst into tears. And I don't want your pity. Now go away, will you? He did something completely unexpected. He knelt at her feet and put both arms round her. Noble person he said. She was so surprised or fascinated, I don't know which, that she made absolutely no effort to put his arms back where they should have been. Yes, he repeated. You're such a noble person. Please, let me be the one to take care of your poor wounded heart. Godfrey, she replied, drying her eyes. You must be mad. I never spoke more seriously, my dearest... I don't ask for your love straight away. I'll be content simply with your affection and respect. Only time can heal wounds as deep as yours. She looked at him, confusion clouding her face. Don't tempt me, Godfrey, she said sadly. I'm unhappy and disturbed enough as it is. Don't tempt me to make things even worse. One question, Rachel. Do you have anything against me? I... I always liked you. I respect and admire you. How many wives can say that, Rachel? How many respect and admire their husbands? Marry me, dearest. I value your respect and admiration 
more than the love of any other woman. Slow down, Godfrey. You're putting something into my head which I never even thought of before. I won't get up until you've said yes. She looked at him curiously. Do you feel as confidently as you speak? Confident enough to give me time? Not to hurry me? My time shall be yours. You won't ask me for more than I can give? My angel, all that I ask of you is your hand. Take it, then. With those words, she accepted him. He pulled her nearer until her face touched his, and she let him... I tried to close my eyes before it happened. I almost screamed in horror. When I opened them again, he was sitting next to her. Shall I speak to your mother? He asked. Or shall you? She seemed to come to her senses. I don't want my mother to hear from either of us until she's better. Godfrey, go now. Come back this evening. She got up and looked in my direction. Who closed those curtains? She came towards me, was about to open the curtains when... My heart almost stopped. Samuel's voice shouted from downstairs, Miss Rachel, where are you? She ran to the door. Miss Rachel, my lady has fainted. Moments later, I was alone. I went downstairs unseen and saw Mr. Godfrey hurrying out to fetch the doctor. I found Rachel on her knees by the sofa. One look at my aunt was enough. She was dead. I was so shocked that I didn't remember until a few days later that she hadn't given me my little remembrance. Chapter 5 Ten days after Lady Verinder's tragic death, the whole family knew about the secret marriage engagement. I didn't see Rachel until a month later. My aunt's will had named her brother-in-law, Godfrey Abelwhite's father, as Rachel's legal adviser. Rachel wanted to move. The house in London reminded her of her poor mother. The house in Yorkshire reminded her of the terrible affair of the Moonstone. Old Mr. Abelwhite suggested renting a house in Brighton. Mrs. Abelwhite could come and stay there with her. He asked Mrs. Abelwhite to make arrangements. Aunt Abelwhite has never done a thing for herself in her life. She found the rented house in Brighton by staying at a hotel in London and asking her son to find it. She found the servants by inviting her niece to tea. Drusilla, dear, I want some servants. You're so clever. Please get them for me. I went into the next room to make a list. I was surprised to see Rachel. She got up and took my hand. Drusilla, she said, I've always been so rude to you. I do hope you'll forgive me. Of course, like a good Christian, I accepted her apology. She invited me to come and stay with her in Brighton. There had been such a remarkable change in the poor child that I felt that I might at last be able to help her towards the only true happiness, the love of God. And the stay in Brighton would be a chance to begin the good work. She suggested that I should go to Brighton first to prepare the house. I accepted. By Saturday afternoon, I had found suitable servants and all was ready.
The next day was the longest in my life. The day after, Brath came early and gave me a key. She's coming to lunch and will stay the afternoon. This is the key to the garden gate. At three, let yourself in. The living room door will be open. Go in and open the door into the music room. You'll find her there, alone. Later that morning, I received a letter from Betteridge. Jennings had stopped him at the station and asked who I was. Later, he had mentioned me to Dr. Candy. The doctor had said he particularly wanted to see me whenever I returned to Fritzinghall. He asked Betteridge to let me know this. The clock of Hampstead Church struck three as I stepped into the garden. The birds were my only witnesses. I crossed the empty living room to the music room door. She was playing the piano. The tune brought back a wave of memories. I had to wait and pull myself together. Finally, I opened the door. Chapter 5 she got up and we faced each other in silence. Rachel, I said gently. She advanced as though against her own wishes, her cheeks a warm, dusky colour. I forgot everything. Saw only the woman I loved walking towards me. I took her in my arms, covered her face with kisses. There was a moment when I thought my kisses were returned... But then suddenly she let out a little cry, like a cry of horror, and pushed me away from her. I saw merciless anger in her eyes, total contempt on her lips. You miserable, heartless coward, she said. After what you've done, you play on my weakness. Trick me into letting you kiss me. You say what you've done. What have I done? What have you done? She cried. You dare ask me that? I kept your crime a secret and suffered the consequences. You were once a gentleman, dear to my mother, dear to me. She dropped into a chair and buried her face in her hands. Rachel, I said, I came here to tell you something very important. Will you at least just listen to what I have to say? She neither moved nor answered. I told her of my discovery of the shivering sand. She never said a word, never even looked at me. I have a question to ask you, I said. Did she show you the nightgown? Yes or no? She jumped to her feet, looked at me searchingly, as though trying to read something in my eyes. Are you mad? She said. I simply replied, Rachel, will you answer my question, please? Her lips curled into a bitter smile. They say your father's death has made you a rich man. Have you come here to repay me for the loss of my diamond? I could control myself no longer. You've done me wrong, I cried. You suspect me of stealing your diamond. I have a right to know why. Suspect you, she exclaimed. I saw you take it with my own eyes. I stood there speechless. Why did you come here? She asked contemptuously. I advanced towards her, hardly conscious of what I was doing. The only words I could find were, Rachel, you once loved me. I took her hand. She looked away, her hand trembling in mine. Let go of me, she said faintly. I led her gently to the sofa and sat her down beside me. Rachel, I said. I can't possibly explain what I'm going to say. Yet it is the truth. You say you saw me take the diamond with your own eyes. What I say is this. I now realize, for the first time, that I took it. Do you still doubt my sincerity? Let go of me, she repeated weakly but her head sank to my shoulder. Her hand unconsciously closed around mine. Tell me everything that happened, I said, from when we said good night to when you saw me take the diamond. She lifted her head, 
made an effort to release her hand. Why go back to it? She said. I'll tell you why, I replied. Because we're the victims of some horrible trick. Tears fell slowly over her cheeks. Oh, she whispered. Oh, how I've tried to persuade myself that. I held her closer. You tried alone, without me to help you. My words seemed to awaken hope in her. What happened after we left each other that night? Did you go straight to bed? She nodded. About twelve o'clock. But I couldn't sleep. I was thinking of you. Her answer almost brought tears to my eyes. I got up at about one o'clock, she continued, and lit a candle. I was about to go into my sitting room to get a book. I had just opened the door, but hadn't gone in.